My first word was duck. Now this choice, or rather this impulse, is not as random as one might think for a landlocked native of Western North Carolina, as these aquatic birds are abundant on Vinyl Haven, an island off the coast of Maine where I have vacationed annually since I was a month old. During my first summers on Vinyl Haven, I was infatuated with the birds that skimmed over the water and dove into its depths for fish, and I grew dizzy with excitement whenever I spotted one. Even now, roughly 17 years later, I still get, perhaps abnormally enthusiastic, whenever I see a duck on the island, despite the fact that sighting one is extremely common. Now, although this bond I have with ducks is reason enough to love Vinyl Haven, a place that my father reminds me daily represents the way life should be, I realize now that this island signifies far more than a sanctuary that harbors ducks and summer memories. In recent years, Vinyl Haven has come to teach me important lessons regarding the link between change and appreciation. Prior to my sophomore year of high school, Vinyl Haven symbolized a place where nothing ever changed. For some of us, such consistency may seem boring, but for me, the predictability of Vinyl Haven was one of the reasons that I loved it. Every visit to Vinyl Haven, in a way, seemed interchangeable with the last trip, as I knew that I could rely on numerous things. The 20 or so hour car ride to Maine would involve several stops at Dunkin' Donuts, and my father, without a doubt, would break several traffic laws, attempting to catch an elusive ferry boat that serves as the only mode of transportation to reach the island. Once we arrived on the island, intact for the most part, I would go to the library and check out the same selection of classic movies, preferably several directed by Alfred Hitchcock or starring Audrey Hepburn that I only allowed myself to watch in Maine. As part of the routine, I would visit the quarry, Lanes Island, the basin, and other scenic spots scattered around the island. I would canoe to the harbor dominated by lobster boats, I would pick blueberries, and I would see several ducks. However, two years ago, my parents began to entertain the idea of renovating our cottage in Vinyl Haven, a cottage that we have owned since I was born. A cottage that, like the island itself, seemed to embody a safe haven, untouched by change. I was attached to this house, almost, if not more so, than the island itself. I loved it despite its moldiness, its spongy floorboards, its stained wallpaper, and it's all around, no easy way to say it, dilapidated state. <laughs> the house lacked charm to say the least and was literally falling apart, but I was so obsessed with it remaining as it had for the majority of my life that whenever my parents mentioned gutting it, I cried. Regardless of, or perhaps in spite of these tears, by my junior year, the cottage had been completely refurbished and altered. It had been changed. Something that I had conceived the island, had conceived my home to be immune to. Before this renovation occurred, I was ignorant to the inevitability of change. I took my surroundings and I took my home for granted. I assumed that everything in my life would be permanent and fixed, incapable of being anything other than what it was and always had been. I assumed that everything would remain safe and stable. Specifically, I assumed that Vinyl Haven and my home would remain untouched and consistent throughout my entire existence. That every vacation would revolve around the traditions of my father's driving antics, the traditions of picking blueberries, and the traditions of watching ducks skim over the ocean. In Diane Keaton's memoir, Let's Just Say It Wasn't Pretty, she writes, nothing is ever the same, nothing is permanent nothing can be trusted to be there. Nothing is safe, including home. Keaton argues that change is unavoidable, that nothing can be viewed as reliable as ever present. The traditions that we conceive to be permanent and ever fixed are guaranteed to change. Nothing, not even the sacred island of Vinyl Haven, can escape it. 
While Keaton contends that change is a certainty in our lives, she also recognizes that overlooking the predictability of change is a tendency that is intrinsic to humanity when she asks us, why do we lie to ourselves? According to Keaton, every day we leave something, someone, some observation behind. For the past 16 or so years of my life, I, as have so many of us, lied to myself. I failed to grasp that life is constantly altering itself, and in doing so, also failed to appreciate it. In Maine especially, because I had presumed that I was always going to be unchanged, I never valued it. It took the inherent landscape of vinyl haven being altered, a landscape, I might add, that I considered incapable of being anything other than what it always had been, for me to cherish my trips to vinyl haven. Because, as I now realize, my visits to Vinyl Haven are no longer interchangeable with previous visits and are no longer consistent. The house I stay in is not the same house that I spent my childhood in, and several of my favorite movies from the library have been lost. Why, so often, does it take us losing something or someone for us to value it or them? Why did it take renovating my summer home for me to fully see the importance and the beauty of Vinyl Haven. According to British writer Jeff Dyer in his book, Yoga for People Who Can't Be Bothered to Do It, <laughs> when you know something intimately, you are often simultaneously oblivious to it. You have to be a stranger to the landscape to regard it as a view. Although Jeff Dyer is referring to the view outside his hotel window, I believe that this quotation can transmit to my perceptions of Vinyl Haven and furthermore, to all of our perceptions regarding life and life experiences. Essentially, Dyer argues that we are incapable of appreciating what we do have. We are unable to recognize that our daily and mundane landscapes are picturesque. Instead, we conceive these landscapes to be backdrops that hold little meaning and significance. This escalates to create a mentality in which we are continually unsatisfied. We dream of traveling to an island, but once we are there, we are only capable of counting down the number of days until we can leave, because, as Dyer states in his book, Out of Sheer Rage, the island we are on is too big and we want to go to a smaller one, or because the island is too small and we want to go to a bigger one. Each of us in this chapel is guilty of, at some point, failing to appreciate certain aspects of our existence. We assume that what we have is always going to be present in our lives, and because of this, we also fail to acknowledge it or honor it as significant. As was the case with Vinyl Haven, I was incapable of valuing my home due to my familiarity with it. Like the tides outside my bedroom window in Maine, change is inevitable. Life, akin to the seawater, is never stagnant. It continues to flow, even when we wish it would remain full, set in a permanent high tide. More so, life depends on change. It revolves around the constant motion of the ocean waves, the constant motion of our lives, growing and adapting to new experiences. I would contend that we are incapable of moving forward and progressing if our lives are mobile. Change is necessary for us to expand intellectually and ideologically. Rather than resent the inevitability of change, we should use our knowledge, our awareness, that nothing is ever the same and that nothing is permanent to better appreciate every day, every moment, every experience, every memory, every visit to Vinyl Haven, and every duck sighting. I urge us all to observe and savor the details of the bird's black head and rapid beating wings before it disappears into the horizon of our ever-changing landscapes. <laughs>